So just to say, um, the structure of my presentation, I'll very briefly lay out the rationale for thinking carefully about the governance of research in particular. Um, then I'll raise a non-exhaustive list of some of the questions and issues relevant to any consideration of the governance of research. Uh, and finally, I'll walk through a few concrete frameworks and proposals um, that have been put forward for research governance in this space. Um, so first of all, when we think about rationales for why we might uh, think carefully about the governance of research in particular, uh, there are a few reasons. First of all, the, there have been persistent controversies over emerging scientific and technological issues in other domains, and a growing awareness, um, I think, that the technologies with the potential to fundamentally transform society have led commentators, social scientists, and policymakers to recognize that uh, many of these technologies should not proceed in isolation of a wider public debate. Uh, and you can see that the Royal Society in 2009 acknowledged the importance of uh, social, legal, and political factors in determining the acceptability of geoengineering in the future. Um, in addition, studies of existing laws have indicated that some of the mechanisms that, may, may, that currently exist may govern aspects of geoengineering and, and research, uh, but that there are gaps and overlaps in existing frameworks. And in particular, as Frank just alluded to, um, so traditional environmental impact assessments will often fail to capture very low risk small experiments um, because, of, because of their small scale. Um, and even ethical frameworks for, for overseeing research uh, will often fail to capture some of the concerns that some wider publics would would want to raise around uh, even very small scale research into these technologies. Um, additionally, another reason for thinking about near term governance of research is uh, to start the progressive development of governance now in order to enable decision making at later stages as science and governance co-evolve. And in light of all of this, uh, any discussion of early or anticipatory governance of research in these domains are confronted with what's known as the Calling Ridge Dilemma, which is that when technologies are at very early stages of R&D and, and therefore sort of easier to steer, if we think of governance as steering, they're often too undeveloped to know, uh, to know with certainty what the effects or risks are likely to be, but at later stages when we know more about these techniques, they're often too interwoven with economic and social interests to be uh, effectively steered. And so many of the frameworks that I'll put forward today that have been put forward in the literature um, and, and some practical experience try to get at this dilemma in particular. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so in, in 2010, the Stratospheric Particle Injection for Climate Engineering was a proposal to do a very small scale outdoor experiment to learn more about solar geoengineering. It was funded in the UK. Um, that the vast majority of actors agreed that the physical risks of this project were quite negligible. I think it was um, intending to spray essentially a bathtub full of water into the air. Um, but nevertheless, concerns were raised by NGOs, scientists, and wider publics about both the merit of this experiment and its wider social and political implications. Uh, because it was considered to be one of the first outdoor geoengineering experiments. And I'll return to SPICE later in more detail, but I wanted to flag it here as a case where the governance issues associated with research were really brought to the fore. Next slide, please. So um, <laughs> there are many issues related to the any discussion of the governance of research, including in SPICE. So for example, what kinds of geoengineering research should governments fund, if any? Who should oversee such research? What criteria should they apply? And how can we encourage international and co cooperation and understanding? Um, many of these issues have actually been raised in earlier presentations. So this first category of questions around what is the object of governance has to do with sort of definitional politics about what one considers to be geoengineering in the first place, and then this sort of lumping and splitting. Do we talk about the governance of geoengineering as a broad category that encompasses a wide range of techniques, or do we focus more narrowly on specific technologies or techniques, and um, scalar questions about where and how such governance might be triggered? Uh, I won't walk through all of these, but you'll see that there are questions about the scales and pacing of governance, uh, how you might do public engagement in effective ways that's actually linked to meaningfully to the oversight of experiments, etc. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, uh, these are a number of proposals 
proposals for the governance of research that have been put forward and some of which have actually been applied. Um, I, uh, I'll focus on a few of these beginning with um, the sort of earliest high level set of principles that have been put forward. Next slide, please. Um, so at least two sets of principles and more actually which are embedded in other reports on geoengineering have been put forward beginning with the Oxford principles in 2009 which were then sort of echoed in the Asilomar principles that were released in 2010 um, and these were a set of sets of both of these were sets of principles developed by uh, scientists and experts including social scientists and interesting many of the principles, the Oxford principles in any case, were derived not from any examination of geoengineering as an exceptional set of techniques, but rather drawing on the experience that experts had in other domains of emerging technology and the kinds of issues that were uh, that were relevant there. Um, one of the things that's interesting here is that you'll see that there's quite a bit of overlap actually across these two sets of principles, including that research should be regulated as a public good, public participation is important, transparency, independent assessment, and concerns about governance. Um, next slide, please. Since, since the elaboration of these sort of higher level principles, one way to uh, elaborate on the, on the Oxford principles in particular and provide practical guidance to researchers and research funders uh, came in the form of the Code of Conduct. The Code of Conduct uh, was put together Together by Aunt, was, was put together by Anna Maria Hubert at the University of Calgary. Uh, the instrument itself is voluntary, although it's based on existing legal sources. It's directed at a wide range of actors uh, and establishes an assessment framework for outdoor experiments uh, that, that makes a couple of requirements for pre, po, pre during, and post uh, research itself. Next slide, please. An, another approach for thinking about um, the governance of research, I'm waiting for the slide to pop up, um, has to do with the uh, setting of substantive standards or around allowed and disallowed zones for outdoor research. Most of the frameworks that have been put forward, put forward in this way are focused on solar geoengineering research. and. Um, rest largely on an assumption that the matter of concern from a regulatory or governance perspective has to do with the risk of physical harm. Um, and can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so the idea here would be to develop physical thresholds below which research can move forward without additional international or perhaps even national oversight beyond what already exists. Uh, this figure comes from a paper published by Granger Morgan and Kate Rickey in 2010, and you can see that the three axes are sort of physical dimensions um, that might be used to think about defining an allowed zone and then the paper that they put forward they suggested that the global scientific community should be responsible for defining a, um, an allowed zone on research but I think questions remain about procedurally how that allowed zone would be defined and by whom. Um, next slide please. In part, recognizing that uh, that the development of substantive standards may only address part of the problem because it doesn't attend to um, the procedural questions around how such standards are developed. Several groups, including most recently um, the group at Scopex that Frank just alluded to, have thought about uh, putting putting forward the notion of advisory commissions to govern research. Uh, and these advisory commissions uh, obviously exist in other domains. People have put forward number of design features including independence, transparency, uh, broadly framed and publicly engaged. Generally these commissions are recommended by these groups to be interdisciplinary in nature and perhaps also include a wide range of stakeholders including perhaps um, representatives from NGOs and indigenous groups. Uh, the advisory commissions could be tasked with a range of activities including recommending guidelines for oversight of research including addressing that kind of thorny question I alluded to earlier about the object of governance and what, what does or does not merit additional oversight. I think there still remain some questions about the scale at which these commissions might operate so Ought they give advice on particular experiments or should they apply at the project level, sub-state, national or international level? Um, and I'm not sure there's a straightforward answer here, but it's certainly an interesting idea. Um, next slide, please. And lastly, we'll loop back and return to the SPICE experiment. So um, in the SPICE experiment in the UK, the 
approach to governance was uh, broadly under the umbrella of what's come, come to be known as Responsible Research and Innovation, or RRI, which is a framework for thinking about the steering of innovation that's been taken up at various places, including most recently by the EU. Um, the approach in particular particular that was enacted in this institutionalized in the case of SPICE was a stage gate approach which generally uses criteria for the progression of research through discrete stages of the R&D process and in this case the stage gates themselves were constructed to include responsible innovation criteria so not just technical and market criteria um, so for example the stage gates included uh, understanding public and stakeholder views, clear communication of the purposes of the project, etc. And the way that this was institutionalized was that an independent panel that reviewed the, the uh, research team's responses to the stage gate questions and then made recommendations to the UK Research Council, to, councils who had funded uh, the experiment to begin with. Eventually the uh, SPICE experiment was cancelled in, in part at least because of a concern about uh, patent application in May of 2012, but I think several lessons have been derived from this experience, many of which were published in Jack Stilgo's book, but also in a paper in 2013 that went through this process, um, including that many of these institutional frameworks, including the stage gate approach and responsible innovation more broadly, should have probably been in place earlier in the research process, but that in general, arguably, it did open up broader reflection and deliberation by the research team itself, evidenced, for example, by the fact that one of the, uh, the lead PIs started a blog post where they, he was reflecting more seriously about um, about his role in geoengineering research and the broader political and social implications. Next slide, please. Um, quickly to wrap up, I think there are several things that I'd like to emphasize. First of all, I would argue that at least among the experts who've been thinking about the government governance of research. Uh, there is some, some general agreement regarding high-level principles around governance, which is not to say that there aren't still some very fundamental disagreements about the value of research in the space at all, even within scientific circles. Uh, what I think we do see is more disagreement around specific proposals for research governance, including around this question of the object of governance. So is it appropriate to have governance frameworks for geoengineering in general, or should we be focused much more on specific techniques, and at what stage should that happen, um, and uh, are new institutions necessary? And then I think that uh, all of these frameworks may have some role to play, but a question would then become, uh, how do these frameworks align or not in practice? And lastly, just the need to attend uh, seriously to how we might think about governing privately funded research. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Janusz.